Welcome back to Next Gen Console Watch, our show following all the news and rumors on the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X. I'm Jamin Hadfield, and as always, I'm joined by Jonathan Dornbush, host of IGN's PlayStation podcast, Podcast Beyond. Beyond. Hey, Damon. And Ryan McCaffrey, host of IGN's Xbox podcast, Podcast Unlocked. Always a pleasure, Damon. Well, it's a very special episode this week because this week is the one-year anniversary of the launches of both the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X. The Series X is actually out the day that we're recording this, November 10th, 2020. And the PS5 was out the day that this episode will actually be going live on November 12th, 2020. So it's hard to believe we've already spent uh, a year with these consoles uh, in our homes. So let's just sort of uh, look back on, on the year that was, talk about what, what, what's been great with these consoles, what's been not so great. Both consoles did get uh, an 8 out of 10 from IGN at their launch. Let's start with, uh, with you, Jonathan. A year into the life of the PlayStation 5, do you think anything's, uh, if your feelings about it change for better or for worse, you still feel like it's a great console? Yeah, I'm I'm overall pretty happy with it, especially when I look back and, and sort of compare it to the PS4's launch uh, first year. I'm, I'm pretty pleased with uh, both the games we've gotten, how the console's running, uh, and, you know, in terms of actually experiencing those things. I'm, I'm definitely, I think, most saddened, of course, by, I, I think, a, a thing that's shared across both of us, most likely, which is, you know, the just fundamental problem of people getting their hands on these things, uh, despite record sales. Sales, you know, the prevalence of bots and scalpers and unfortunately the shortages that are preventing more supply meeting that demand are, are just really frustrating to see because there's a lot of really cool stuff that's, you know, just starting, uh, especially on PlayStation 5 that we're going to see, I think, continue to evolve and grow. There, there's definitely some, you know, problems, I think, to still iron out with the, the PS5 UI. Those are probably some of the biggest lingering concerns, which is a weird thing to have as a problem because some of these problems are uh, things PlayStation seemingly already solved in past generations UI. But, uh, you know, other than that, the, the act of actually using the console, it's as quiet as I hoped it would be. Games are running great on it. Uh, you know, the DualSense has been a lot of fun to mess with, even if not every game uses it as much as I'd hope, but overall, I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. Yeah, you mentioned the the su- supply constraints that both consoles are facing, but it's an interesting dichotomy because the PlayStation 5 is selling very well compared to PlayStation 4. It's outpacing the PS4 in sales for the first year of its life. They were at 13.4 million units sold as of September. Uh, so it's just it's interesting to consider how much more they could be selling uh, if supplies weren't constrained uh, as they are. And, as we expect them to continue to be into 2022, unfortunately. Let's talk about something very controversial, Jonathan, the design of the PlayStation 5. Uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. People had mixed feelings about it when it was revealed. Now that it's been in your home for a year, how do you feel about it today? I feel like, for me, I feel like I've made peace with it. It's sitting right here next to my Xbox Series X, and it doesn't bother me as it once did. Sure. Well, uh, you know, I know I was someone who got strange looks, probably both on the show and others for saying I enjoyed how silly the design was from day one. I thought, you know, they're trying to make it this futuristic console, might as well make it look space age and odd. Um, You know, my biggest problem with it still is that it's hard to fit in most standard uh, TV setups, uh, finding the correct dimensions of either a shelf or somewhere nearby your TV that it doesn't look like it's just kind of thrown there is definitely more of a problem than I, uh, you know, than it should be. But overall, I still am happy with it. I prefer the digital design. I do think that is the better looking design, but I have the the disc version with the small little uh, disc baby bump on the side, uh, which I, I don't love quite as much. But yeah, you know, I've gotten looked uh, used to looking at it. I like the 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 way the lights kind of shine on the the fins themselves when it's a little bit darker in the room and the, sort of the glow of the orange or blue looks cool. I'm still fine with it. It definitely is ostentatious and very much the thing that I see first when I look at sort of my TV design display, but I don't mind it. And I, I, I really haven't minded it more than now that it's been sitting there for a year. I want to talk about the first year games for both consoles, but let's jump over to the Xbox side. Ryan, you reviewed the Series X for IGN, is that right? I did. Gave it an eight as well. How are you feeling about it today, one year later? Still great. I mean, I, I would probably give it the same score. I mean, it's uh, it's still an excellent console. It's Microsoft. They they got a lot of it right out of the gate, uh, which they you know did not do with the Xbox One. It took them a couple of hardware revisions. Uh, you know, the the Xbox One S and then the One X where they really kind of got it to a good place by by any metric. But yeah, they, they nailed it out of the gate here. It's, as 
Jonathan says about the PS5, same applies to the Xbox. It's quiet. It's been reliable. Like we have not heard any, you know, big failures or common problems with the Xbox Series X or the Series S for that matter. Uh, so yeah, they're uh, and, and then on the software side, you know, the usability side, the UI has been great. Uh, it's evolved slightly over time. The quick resume has been working really well, and that's a nice, you know, I think thing that we assume now, like oh, every, every, consoles just have to have this, which is. The telltale sign of a of a great feature. So yeah, it's Microsoft has delivered on the platform really well, I think, in the first year. So if we're gonna talk about games, we, we probably have to talk about uh kind of the game of the moment right now, which is Xbox, or I'm sorry, uh Forza Horizon 5, not an you know, an Xbox Series X next gen exclusive, but the best place to play on on a console is the Xbox Series X. Ryan, I know you've been a longtime fan. I've yeah. I've never played a Forza game, but I actually just installed it. I'm not I'm not like a car driving game guy, but the hype is just it's too loud. I can't not check out this game, especially since it's on Game Pass right now. Well, good. I mean, and that's you, you just hit on a big part of it, which we talked really in depth about on Podcast Unlock this week, our weekly Xbox show. If anybody's interested in checking that out, Game Pass is a big part of it, and that sort of the water cooler like collective talk is this game's amazing. You've got to try it, and well. It's, it's there on Game Pass. It doesn't you don't have to reach into your pocket for anything extra to pay any more to play this game. So you just download it, you give it a go. And uh, something that I talked about on Unlock this week is that I think a, a subtle but very key distinction between Forza Horizon, in this case, Forza Horizon 5, and pretty much every other game with cars in it, any other like primarily car game, is I think Horizon is it is a driving game not a racing game. There are, There is racing in it, to be sure, plenty of it, but it's really, it is approachable. If you just like cars, Forza Horizon is a very welcoming, very inviting game. You don't, it's not this like serious buttoned up, we're going to check our tire pressures and we're going to race the most simulated thing we possibly can. You know, motorsport does a great job of that and Gran Turismo does a great job of that and looking forward to GT uh, when it rolls around in 2022. But uh, Horizon is just so like this is this is going to sound like the dumbest back of the box quote ever. But I've thought this that this first popped into my head with Forza Horizon 2, which was set in the idyllic south coast of France. And I feel like it applies now to the entire series. And that's Forza Horizon is like the video game equivalent of a perfect 72 degree summer day. Where there's just, you know, the little gentle breeze, there's nothing unpleasant about it whatsoever. It's just, it's persistently wonderful and nice. And it's just, you know, there's always something interesting to do. There's never any stress or tension or pressure or really any frustration even. You know, if you if you don't win a race, you can just retry the race. And uh, there's just, there's endless things to do. It looks gorgeous, particularly as you noted, Damon, on the Series X. Uh, it, it offers a a uh, performance mode or a, a a quality mode. I've been rocking the quality mode. I just want to have it as pretty as possible, and it's been a pretty steady uh, frame rate even in that. So yeah, it's it's probably my game of the year vote. If we voted today, we are not mm -hmm. voting today. There are more big games coming, but it's that good. We gave it a ten out of ten. Luke Riley, our resident racing slash driving game expert, and I I couldn't agree with him more. Well, I'm excited to check it out. And of course, we've got Halo Infinite coming up in less than a month, which is it's interesting. We uh, Originally, we would have been looking back on the one year anniversary of the launch of Halo Infinite. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Plans hadn't changed. So what, what do you think about the overall Xbox Series X library at its first year? Not a lot of next gen exclusives. But that doesn't mean it doesn't have you know a very strong library, uh, a great place to play a lot of third party games. And of course, we have to mention Game Pass, right? Yeah, I mean, Game Pass is a huge component of it. But yeah, I mean, I think in being fair, it has not been a great first year as far as console exclusives goes. Horizon 5, <laughs> right at the tail end of the first year, just a, a you know, like a last second three pointer, just draining it from half court at, by all means. And yes, there was Microsoft Flight Simulator, another 10 out of 10 in there. That's really about the only major next gen exclusive on the console. Uh, and there have been, you know, the Psychonauts 2, it, which is actually a multi-platform game as a result of how it started its life before Microsoft picked it up. That's a game of the year contender for a lot of people. 
Uh, there, there are definitely great games, but yeah, I, I would, I, I would have liked to have seen more out of the first year. Of course, I understand the pandemic and games. A ton of games have been delayed, but I, I definitely think the 360s first year was significantly better than the Xbox mm-hmm. Series X's first year, and I mean even the the Xbox One, as as troubled as that console was, like it had a pretty good first year with regard to exclusives. Uh, mm-hmm. You had Titanfall in the mix. Forza Motorsport 5 was a day one title. Rise, which, yeah, wasn't like the greatest game, but it was it's kind of a, become a cult classic. And then Sunset Overdrive was in there. So there were some actually really good exclusives there. And, and again, overall, a, a decent first year with regard to exclusive games on the Series X. The good news is uh, it's going to get way better very quickly and probably it's going to stay good this time, unlike with the Xbox One era. Exciting to think about. Uh, Jonathan, what about the the game side over on PlayStation 5 in its first year? Obviously, Sony known for its big first party exclusives, but there was really only one that we've gotten this first year, right? In Ratchet and Clank, Rift Apart. Of course, there are other exclusives like Deathloop, Returnal, but I think Ratchet and Clank is sort of like the big first party uh, exclusive that we're looking at during this this time frame. Is that right? I mean, it's certainly the biggest, but I wouldn't discount either of those other games. Uh, oh, no, not whatsoever. at all. Um, you know, for a first year, uh, especially from PlayStation first party, if, if you want to go uh, sort of that route in terms of developed, uh, really only the, the PS4 after launch day had infamous Second Son during its first mm-hmm. year. You know, they had uh drive club as well uh w- which had its uh tumultuous uh sort of post-launch life mm-hmm. uh and the little big planet 3 which was done by sumo uh and, and you know that was the first year for the ps4 uh this year we got ratchet and clank rift apart which is another phenomenal uh game from insomniac after launch where they did spider-man remastered and miles morales uh for launch day uh we got uh returnal earlier in the year from housemark which then became uh you know a sony first party studio after that since they were so pleased with it uh, and then we also, of course, got Deathloop by Arcane, which, uh, you know, will be a timed exclusive uh, since they are now owned by Microsoft. But, uh, you know, in terms of PlayStation first party and both published and developed exclusives and just like uh, console launch exclusives for the first year, I'm I'm pretty happy with that, especially once you start to consider uh, both cross gen and exclusive to this gen uh, games from launch when you put in stuff like Demon Souls from Blue Point, another acquired studio by Sony this year. Uh, things like Sackboy, a big adventure, was a really great platformer back then as well. Uh, and then, you know, you've had a few indies throughout the year, uh, stuff like Kena, Bridge of Spirits most recently. Uh, it, it's been, I think, a very solid first year if you're looking for, uh, you know, exclusives on PlayStation console wise. That is what PlayStation tries to bill itself as and has been billing itself as for for the last generation. So in terms of that, you know, whether you were on PS4 or PS5, I think it was a pretty good year. But I think especially if you were on PS5, Returnal, Deathloop and and Ratchet and Clank are three of my favorite experiences this year. And I think are, uh, you know, really, really fun and show just the cusp of what uh, developers are really doing at the start of this generation. Did you get Astro's Playroom in there, Jonathan? Oh, yeah. Of course. Well, I was going to talk about that more with the, yeah. the dual sense. But yeah, no, <laughs> Astro's, yeah. let's talk about it. Uh, Astro's Playroom. I was I was saving it for then, Ryan, but you, you're My forcing bad. me to talk about a game I love. How dare you? Um, no. I, yeah. And of course, Astro's Playroom, which I think is still the best showcase for for what the dual sense can do i think it is the most probably nintendo-esque thing that sony has put out in some time and mm-hmm. obviously they're doubling down on team asobi and their future you know unfortunately sony japan studio was largely shuttered and restructured to really just be team asobi uh but i think everyone you know when you think about the dual sense astro's playroom is the thing you tell people to try to show what it can pull off and i still don't think it's been matched i think there have been really clever implementations of the dual sense but i don't think any have been just as all out fun and inventive is what they did in Astros. Mm-hmm. And so I can't wait to see what comes from Team Asobi, but that's a thing, you know, it's a free pack in for the PS5. And so for anyone who is getting a, a PS5 in the future, this holiday or after, Astros Playroom, not only because it's smaller and should probably more easily download on your system than other bigger games, but it should absolutely always be the first thing you play on PS5. It is it is such a great showcase for the dual sense, for the 3D audio, and and just for the imagination of what that team can pull off uh it is really still a a phenomenal thing to jump into so ryan a year in do you feel like uh the dual sense controller is something the xbox series x is missing maybe i don't know i it's uh 
I mean, this this has been a, a near perfect controller for years mm. at this point. Like it's well, we talked about this at length in the run up uh, to the launches last year on the show. And yeah, I mean, I would I love to see those kinds of specific haptic features on the Xbox controller. Definitely. So, you know, at some point, maybe we'll get them. Uh, but I also have really no complaints about <laughs> about it's like just asking for it's like you have a a ninety five percent good controller. It's just kind of could it, could it be a hundred? Sure, that'd be great. But I'm pretty darn yeah. happy with the ninety five percent. Sure, I don't know, Ryan. It feels like things have have improved tremendously for Xbox, and even just like you know, this is like hard to, to quantify, but just anecdotally, yeah. comments on IGN and on YouTube, it just it seems like people, gamers in general, are feeling a lot more friendly towards Xbox this generation. I think one way to describe uh, last generation PS4 and Xbox One is if if both platforms were like ships that were launching at the same time, yes, the PS4 ship got a really good start and the Xbox One ship started sinking right away. Just and Xbox hit, had to just spin, hit, a, yeah, hit a rock right away and started and they had taking to, on water. They had to spend years just plugging the holes so the ship didn't sink completely. And by the time they sort of got things set up the ps4 was just you know so far ahead of them yeah but I, it feels different to me this generation does it to you absolutely yeah and and microsoft has earned that it is you know it was never going to be fixed overnight you know the mm. the first party problem was never going to be fixed overnight which is in turn the exclusive games problem was never going to be fixed overnight even the the xbox one being a, a marginally but noticeably underpowered to the ps4 uh be, was not going to be fixed overnight and that took the xbox one s and then the one x was demonstrably more powerful than the ps4 pro so they solved the hardware situation and they've been working very diligently on the software situation with all their studio acquisitions and and reinvesting into uh their first party games and we are finally starting to see that i mean you know you look at year two we're looking at halo infinite after it's over you know greater than one year delay and uh mm-hmm. i guess now that th- this show's airing on friday i can tell you that i've played for the first four hours of halo infinite and i'm extremely excited about it and i was someone that severely disliked halo 5's campaign as a big halo fan that game five rubbed me the wrong way and infinite uh really feels good so this we already know the multiplayer is awesome from the mm-hmm. the multiplayer test flights so year two you you're poised to have halo come back in a big way You've got a uh, Redfall from Arcane uh, on tap. You have, I guess, well, technically Starfield is would be year three if it if it yeah, does come in on time. I mean, 11, 20, 11, 11 would be one, one day, day <laughs> one day still, into yeah. year through the first day kicking off year three <laughs> I mean, of well. the Series X. But yeah, you've uh, so you've got that, and then uh, maybe the the Forza Motorsport reboot comes in somewhere mm. in there. There's a there's a lot that's uh that's out there that could slide into year two as well so yeah it's the ship is they just rebuilt it they built a new ship the, they let that other ship yeah. sink and the, we got a new <laughs> ship with game pass and with all this great stuff and the community you know sees it it's you know you, you say what you will about the the sort of vitriol that the gaming community is capable of but they're also capable of embracing a developer and a, a publisher a platform holder who has done the work i mean like a great example, of course, classically is No Man's Sky, which was mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. received so harshly at launch. But now, after all the work that Hello has put into it, No Man's Sky is beloved now and deservedly so. And, and you've seen that with stuff like uh, Fallout 76 even went through that. And, and I think the Xbox as a platform is like mm-hmm. on the, the coming out of that on the good side now. So mm-hmm. it's been really great to see. And uh, Jonathan, looking ahead into year two of, of PS5, what... How do, how do things look? What has you excited? You know, I, th- I think be a the, good year. It, yeah, it, it will also be a really good year. And, and that's what's exciting for me is that, uh, you know, when both of these systems and those companies are doing well, it just encourages both of them to do better and to continue to meet expectations. And so I, I am very excited for a generation where it doesn't feel like sort of a, a knockout punch from the start and, you know, moving forward from there. It does really feel like there's going to be a lot of exciting competition to come. But in terms of 
PS5 specifically next year, just PlayStation in general. You know, we have, I think, two heavy hitters we hoped would have shown up this year uh, when it comes to sort of the big cinematic blockbuster thing we expect from PlayStation, which is Horizon Forbidden West and God of War Ragnarok. And then, of course, as Ryan mentioned, Gran Turismo 7 is also set for next year. We have dates for Horizon and Gran Turismo, both February and March, uh, respectively. And then God of War is, you know, just sometime in 2022. So we'll see there. But, uh, you know, PlayStation has continued to amass uh, a few more developers as well. I think this past year has been probably the most acquisitions they've done, uh, at least since I can remember for, for quite some time. They I think they brought on four or so uh, new studios. And there's a lot of teams within Sony we haven't heard from in quite some time. So even if that doesn't lead to stuff launching next year, I think we could potentially see uh, a lot of big announcements. And, and I do think, you know, the success of things like Miles Morales coming off of Spider-Man shows you can do a smaller game similar to Lost Legacy coming off of Uncharted 4. You can put those types of smaller games out from these studios where they get to maybe experiment a little bit, double down on a thing that really worked, and we can maybe have a little bit less of a gap between major releases. I'm hoping we maybe get a few more surprises like that. But, you know, with that that trio alone from the first party and, of course, stalwarts like MLB The Show and, and probably a few other exclusives, uh, you know, from uh, different third-party studios uh you know we're still waiting to hear what's going on with things like pragmata from capcom and final fantasy 16 from square uh it could be a really really huge year for ps5 as well and uh, it's really exciting to have a potentially awesome year i think for both consoles yeah both consoles are looking really good going into year two uh, a lot of the biggest games that everyone is excited about for both platforms should be starting to roll out within over the next 365 days uh before we go we have the results of last week's poll we asked what will be your go-to next-gen accessory this holiday? And almost 50% of you said you're looking for a storage expansion. I thought that was interesting. Also, a quarter of you said you're looking for an extra controller for your next-gen console. I hope you've been very good and you get what you're looking for under your next-gen Christmas tree. We have a poll for you to vote on for next week. How would you grade both these consoles first year, PS5, Xbox Series X? Uh, 8F, how would you rate their first year on the market? Make sure to vote at IGN.com. We'll share the results with you next week. And that will do it for this edition of Next Gen Console Watch. Thank you so much for watching the show for the past two years now. We started in early 2020 as the run-up to the launch of both of these consoles. And here we are today still covering um, uh, both, both PS5 and Xbox Series X because they're just such uh, exciting platforms. There's so much going on. So thank you for watching the show every week. We're here every Fridays, 6 a.m. Pacific, 9 a.m. Eastern with all your PS5 and Xbox Series X news. Thank you to Jonathan. Thank you to Ryan. My name is Damon and we'll see you next week.